And you know, Miradell, we started this program many years ago, five years ago now, People Making a Difference. And today our guest is Frank Mecklenburg, and he is a man who's making a, a big difference with his precious wife, Charlotte. They were in Papua New Guinea uh, for more than 30 years translating the Bible, translating the word you know, into their language, the local language of the Fiwo people. Now in Papua New Guinea, there's 825 different tribal linguistic groups. And uh, it's an amazing story. And uh, you're going to be thrilled to hear what Frank has to say because it is truly a major accomplishment to reach these people, primitive peoples, uh, with the Word of God. And you'll see their precious Papuan people, Melanesian people, and it's a beautiful story of how now he wants to uh, also have the Word go from Jerusalem. Well, you know, I've always been a lover of tribal people, as you know. And I had a little preview with Frank this morning about his work with the unreached tribes and told him that I had had the privilege of a young woman of working with eight unreached tribal peoples in India and that he went out in 66 and so did I. And it was one of the great privileges of my life. But Frank is, is, going, is talking about his work now in the, in the uh, Tanakh. And here is, a, here is one here. And Many times in the Christian world, we're not aware of the riches and the inheritance that we have in what has been termed, unfortunately, the Old Testament. It is the living word of God. And it was this word that spoke this world into creation. It was this word that brought Adam from the dust. It was this word that raised up Abraham out of paganism and brought him to this land. It was this word that gave us this land and how Amen. precious and eternal is this word. Let's hear more about it. Don't right go now. away. We'll, don't go away. We'll be right back. Well, we're so pleased and blessed to have Frank Mecklenburg with us today. And Frank is a, a special gentleman whom the Lord has called to translate the Bible into various languages. And we're so glad that you're with us today. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to our viewing audience and give them a little bit of your background. Now, uh, you went to Papua New Guinea in what year? 1966, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about the same time we came to Israel, that's just a right. few year, years later. Um, and uh, what was it that uh, drew you to go to Papua New Guinea, of all places? Well, I came to the Lord when I was in college, and uh, God just put in my heart so strong about the people that didn't have any of the word to read in their language and had no written language. And then the people didn't know anything about Jesus or Yeshua, you know, and uh, it was just such a strong call, you know, in my life to, I thought, wow, I want to have a part in this. You know? Now, you, you went to Papua New Guinea, but you obviously had to have a lot of training ahead of time to prepare you. What, what kind of, what, what was that about? Well, Wycliffe Bible Translators has special linguistic training courses that prepare us for, for going out, and uh, as well as, you know, uh, Bible training, um, uh, seminary, and, uh, and then continuous ongoing training while we're on the field, uh, you know, doing the translation as well. So there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And what, um, what was the, uh, how, the people that you went to, how did you select those, the five world people? Well, that was hard because we got to New Guinea and, and of course, discovered once there that there was 823 different languages in that country. <laughs> and so, literally, we went all over the country praying and looking because we wanted the group that, that God wanted us to go to. And, um, and he um, just put on our heart this group of people way out in the western part of the country near Indonesia that had just been recently contacted. And, and uh, there was another... Um, missionary group from Australia that uh, had written to Wycliffe and said, can you send somebody out here? Because we'd like these people to have the scriptures. And, uh, and so, so uh, God opened the door for that. So now we're going to have a look at the, what, what life was like there. Now this is your first house in 1967. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so what was our first house as a married couple that we owned and it was 14 by 14. <laughs> and that had a leaf roof and, uh, and a palm floor. Was that floor 14 feet by 14 feet? Yeah, 14 feet by 14 feet. <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> it wasn't too private. People could look through the walls and see what we were doing, you know, and uh, so it was very exposed. And you know, here's and, uh, this next picture is, is Charlotte's very fancy kitchen. Yeah, right. We were fortunate to have a little bit of a gas stove to cook on, you know, but uh, <laughs> it was pretty... Pretty primitive. You now, know. how many children did you have in Papua New Guinea? Two, There's two boys. Frank and boys, Brent. Yeah. I mean, Brent and Ted. Brent and Ted, yeah. Ted and Brent. But oh. Ted's the oldest. Uh -huh. Now, the next picture here, you are sitting with these people on the floor of the house. Uh, what, what's that about? Well, that's how they sit and, and uh, having uh, discussions about the meaning of words and about uh, discussion of the Bible and uh, doing the, the translation right there on the floor with the people. And that's, that's how they didn't have chairs, you know, they just uh, sat on the floor. And, uh, and then uh, my, my, what I want to know is that you, you, how did you to write them? Their, 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 you, you, did they speak some English or how did you communicate with them? We just started pointing to things and uh, uh -huh. getting words for, for rock and for banana. Rock was tomb and banana was sum and, uh, <laughs> and building a, a, a little dictionary, you know. We had yeah. no computers. So just pencil and paper, you know, and, and listening. Amazing. There was one translator who was pointing to everything and kept getting the same word and found out he got the word for index finger instead of what he was pointing to, you know, <laughs> so there are problems, but we managed to <laughs> Now, finally, you got the scriptures into the hands of the people. That must have been quite a day. It was a best, very special day, the biggest feast that they'd ever had in the history of their nation, of their people. It was so important to them. It wow. was so moving. There were tears and, and rejoicing and dancing and, uh, and a very a traditional ceremony, you know, but these, these people were so excited that the Word had become flesh. And now this uh, brother flesh. Jacobin, is he uh, one of your that's early... A, that's a woman. And, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, she was, we knew her when we first got there. And uh, she learned how to read the language. And I'll never forget the day when she was uh, at the house and she was reading her Bible, and I just said, oh, it's so wonderful that you know how to read and that you can read God's Word, that you have God's Word in your language. <laughs> and she looked up to me with tears in her eyes, and she said, Frank, Foleno, Kaba, Ken. And she said, you know, when you go back to America, would you thank the churches? Would you thank your, your people? Because if, if your parents had not let you go, if your churches had not sent you, we wouldn't have God's word today, you know. It was a very moving experience. Wow. Very moving. That's so touching. And Frank, um, uh, so now you you've come a full circle, as it was, as it were, sort of. You've 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 done this and this Bible, and I want the people to see this. This is a, a lifetime of work of Charlotte and Frank Mecklenburg, and I want to honor you and thank you for this tremendous gift that you've given to these precious people. Well, we know we couldn't have done it without God, that's for sure, we give Him the glory. But and uh, tell me what was the impact on the actual people through the Word? Some real, were there changes in their understanding or? Oh, my, yes, there were. Um, the whole fact of, of who, who Yeshua was and, uh, and understanding what He did here in the land and uh, uh, they didn't. They couldn't understand that without it being in their own in their own language. Uh, uh, terms that you couldn't be translated, like the term for hope that we prayed for. How can we have this word for hope? And and suddenly somebody came up with this idiom in their language, which was to smell something. And it comes from when they go hunting with the dogs for possum, and the dogs can smell the possum, and they know the possum is there. <laughs> and gives so them hope. there's hope because we smell heaven. We smell what God is going to do. And Amen. that's our hope. It's, it's real. Yeah. It's not like in English, we hope something's going to happen, but it's, it's solid. It's something for certain, you know. And, uh, and so that was a word, an illustration of one of the words that really meant so much to them. But there were so many. And, uh, and just to see people reading it and saying, now we know whether the pastor is teaching the truth or not, you know, because now we can look it up in the scriptures and see. And, uh, so it was very exciting. Now, what, what drew you to come to Israel? Well, that's interesting. I had always wanted to come to Israel. And uh, our, our son and daughter-in-law were here praying with a, with a group, and, uh, and our granddaughter was born here. So we 
my wife came and then she came back and said, we need to go back to Israel. We, I, she feel, felt at home here. Now this was while you were still in Papua New Guinea? No, we were in the States now. Okay. We were doing uh, recruitment with Wycliffe and speaking to young people about translation. And so we came here for seven months in 2002 and, and God laid this tremendous burden on my heart that the Tanakh has not been translated. In, in these languages around the world. Now for our viewers, the Tanakh is, is the mm. expression for the Word of God, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. That's Tanakh, that's like from Genesis right through to Malachi. Correct, that's right. Okay, so why would you think that it's important that it comes from Israel? Well, I think the thing that God showed me is that this is where the original commission was given on the Mount of Olives, you know, 2,000 years ago when he told these disciples, not just Jerusalem, not just Judea, but Samaria and the ends of the earth, you know? And, uh, and here's people who know the Hebrew, uh, people who, uh, who are blessed people, and people who uh, uh, know the geography and, and the things about the land, and, uh, and it seems like a no-brainer that they, they're the ones that can go out and, and connect with these people, especially the ones that now have the New Testament, but not the, not the old, not, not the Tanakh. Yeah. And, um, and this is the vision that God has given us, that he's calling Hebrew believers or Hebrews to, to go out, Israelis to go out and to have a part in this. And, uh, so, and, and so this is why you started Zion Pathways? That's right. But for, to, to be a liaison, to, to try to uh, implant the idea and the need for Tanakh in, in these languages around the world. And of course, our focus is Papua New Guinea because that's where we've been from, but, uh, uh, but all over the world that there's a need for that. And then also to help people in the nations better understand Israel, to connect them to things like Israel Vision TV and things like that so they can learn and understand about the Israeli people. And uh, what has been the response? Have you been back to um, Papua New Guinea with the idea that like people would come and and, and, and teach? Yes. And the first time I went in 2002, there was such a great response from the people. One man stood up, the local Fiwal man stood up in the church service and said, you haven't just come here from Israel, you've come here like John the Baptist, you're making a road from Israel to the nations. And I, that just blew me away, you know, when I heard that. And then in 2004, uh, I was able to go with, with Gabrielle Geffen, a Messianic believer here in, in Israel to visit uh, several different people groups. In, and what did the Papua people Guinea. think when they met somebody from Israel? They, <laughs> they had a terrific welcome. They just, the people there just love Israel and, and, they, uh, and they wanted him to share and they wanted to learn about Israel. And, uh, and, and the, the, the people in 2002, I was blown away. They gave me 500 U.S., the equivalent, the equivalent of 500 U.S. dollars to bring back to bless Israel from, from Papua oh, New Guinea. You wow. Know. Oh, that's so touching. Well, I know and I want to honor um, Paul and Mackie Sambuko from uh, Papua New Guinea who are partners with us mm -hmm. here in, okay. uh, in Israel. And they, they support us. And I'm, I'm oh, always yes. amazed <laughs> to get a letter from Papua New Guinea. With, yeah. And they usually send $100 to support our work here. And so we're very grateful for that. But now, uh, so what would it mean uh, to, in real terms, how could you train um, or, or how can you inspire local people here in Israel to have a desire to translate the T Tanakh into the Bible, into the languages of these different um, tribes around the world? How do you go about that? Do you, do you, how do you encourage people for this? Well, I think the first step is to connect with Israeli believers in congregations and to, as I've been doing, to plant the idea of missions, to plant the idea of, of the potential of going out to help people educationally and, and uh, in translation and, and to um, then uh, help those young people who do feel the call to get some training. It can be, the training can be done through people like Gabrielle Geffen. It can be done through the Home for Bible Translators. It can be done through, uh, through Randall Booth and, and the, the whole connection of translation uh, and Hebrew that, that's going on. And they can get some training at Hebrew University. We can, we can guide them. We can, uh, we can help them to learn the principles of translation. And then another very important part of the training is that once they connect with a people group in that country, 
and, and begin to live with them. And, and they can learn the language. It's written down already. The linguistics are done. They have a church. They have a New Testament. But these nationals that are chosen to work on the, on the Tanakh will go through a training program that's already set up in that country, and the Israeli will go through it with them. Mm -hmm. And so he'll learn with those nationals about the principles of translation and help them get started with the translation of the, of the, uh, of the Tanakh. Well, uh, the word of God says in, in Isaiah that the law shall go forth from Zion, and the That's word right. of the Lord from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's certainly a biblical fulfillment that uh, the, the word, the original word, the Hebrew word, and I want our viewers to understand why this is important, that Hebrew has such a rich um, basis, and, and uh, to understand the Hebrew, we are always blessed and we get uh, our understanding enlightened by the Hebrew words. Mm -hmm. And now, can you imagine, they'll be the ones that will translate the Bible into these local dialects. So they won't have to go through uh, a German translation or a, a King James translation or, exactly. you know, a French translation. They can have the word directly into their language from the source. That's right. And, uh, and to think that it's hard for us to put ourselves in the place of people who have no scriptures at all or have just the, the New Testament and not the, and, and not the Genesis through Malachi. There's so much there, you know, and, and we, it's hard for us to picture that, but it's, uh, it's not fair that they don't have it. You know, we have all these different translations that we read in English and so forth, but uh, why, why shouldn't they have it too, you know, and so that's... Uh, so what is your vision for Israel now? You, you, would, you would hope to have like a training center of some kind. Is this like your vision? We'd like to have a study center. That okay. Okay, the Lord has really laid this on our heart. Uh, perhaps in the Negev area, uh, a piece of land with, with enough housing to, to bring some of those people from, uh, from Papua New Guinea to experience the geography and experience some things about where the history took place here and, and the impact they can have upon their translation. And nationals have told me this is, this is a need that they already feel. And, and then even to bring people from the states that want to do more than a regular tour, they want to maybe do some archaeology or some specialized things, you know. And uh, so this is a vision God has given us, and we're waiting upon God to see how he opens the door. And uh, I know that you have a, a heart to use a, a solar-powered energy for this mm -hmm. uh, center. Mm -hmm. you're, so you, you're right up to speed, brother. You're really out there uh, uh, with, the, with what's happening in, the, in Israel. Israel is, is one of the leading countries in use of uh, solar energy. All right, that's, that's great. So and it's not really entirely new because eventually we were there for 30 years in Papua New Guinea, but toward the end in our village we had solar panels that ran car batteries that ran our computer and, and so <laughs> forth. So, so it's been there before. But anyway, that's, that's right. Yeah, we see solar power as a real... So you're not retiring. No, we have officially <laughs> retired from Wycliffe, but uh, as some people say, God has refired me, you know, because uh, we, we just want to serve him as long as we have the strength and health to do so, and uh, he wants us to do that. So. Well, uh, how can, if, if someone that's watching today would like to, uh, you know, help you and, and help you realize this vision, how could they do that? Well, certainly prayer is important, and certainly... If someone feels led that they want to give to our organization, then uh, uh, they can uh, go on the website, which is uh, uh, zionpathways.org, and they can get all the information there. Okay. Uh, they can get a hold of me uh, in the States or, or here in Israel. Um, uh, well, I want to say that people who are watching, if they'd like to be in touch with you and they don't Mm -hmm. didn't get that at zionpathways.org mm -hmm. but they can always write to us here that's at Jerusalem right. at Israel Vision mm -hmm. and we can then pass their names on to you yeah, we'd be delighted to do that well Frank and we're so thankful for you being with us today we want to uh, honor you and uh, say that uh, our, our prayers are with you and Charlotte mm -hmm. that God will give you as we say in Hebrew Ad Rima, until 120 mm -hmm. so you can continue this fantastic work of uh, doing this Bible translation into from the original language. Yes. That's Anything right, further that's you important. want to say finally? Well, it's just good to be here, Jay. Thank you. Blessings on you and your ministry and uh, Thank you. your wife. And, uh, well, it's good to be here. that's our vision uh, to always try to help you to see people making a difference. We named this program People Making a Difference uh, 
you know, many years ago, and we started these series of magazine shows, and uh, Frank and Charlotte are people who are truly making a difference. I know that you enjoyed that, and the more you hear, the more you want to hear. And uh, let's believe that we can provide many more wonderful insights into the lives of some of God's great people. And I have always believed that the greatest people in the world are the hidden ones, the quiet ones, True. the people that are out there sweating and doing the work and not making a big noise. And it's such a privileged day to be able to have Frank today in our home uh, to share his life with you, 30 years living in um, dire conditions that most people wouldn't even consider. And uh, we are so grateful for the privilege. You know, you are important to us as well. Those of you who are viewing this program, we appreciate you so much. And we want this program to be a blessing to you, and then you can be a blessing back to us, we hope. How would that be? You know, right now is Purim time. We're just coming up to Purim. And Uncle Mordecai said to this beautiful young lady, Esther, when she was going chosen to go before the king, uh, a most powerful man in the world at that time in Persia, and uh, Uncle Mordecai said to, and he was Jewish, of course, and Esther was Jewish, and he said to her, you have been brought to, perhaps you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, don't flub it. Go and make an appeal for the salvation and deliverance of your people. And uh, that's exactly what she did. It took a lot of courage, and she had a lot of responsibility on her shoulders to speak out for her people, and she did. And of course, you know the story that the evil plot of Haman uh, was exposed and, and Israel, the Jewish people, were saved. Now, I want to encourage you. I believe that you have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is an hour in which we too can speak up for truth and righteousness and speak out for the Bible and the Word of God and for the Jewish people. And you know, Mordecai said something very significant at the end of that. He said, if you don't, salvation and deliverance will arise from another quarter for the Jewish people. Why? Because the Word of God is pro has promised that the Jewish people would be forever. Until the sun, the moon, and the stars fall out of the sky, the Jewish people will be a nation and a people. And so God, the Jewish people's position is safe, I mean, is sound in the Word of God and in the promises of God. We're going through difficult times when some of our neighbors want to wipe us out, but we can make a difference. We can stand up like Esther of old and say, yes, we are going to speak out for truth and righteousness and for the preserva preservation of this people, the Jewish people. I'd like to say that um, <clears throat> when you see people on television, you assume that they receive lots of mail and that people are communicating with them True. and even encouraging them. You would be very interested to know, I can tell you almost the numbers of letters we get from nations. Germany, let's try about four a month. Australia, maybe five. New Zealand, three. America, maybe 20. And I find that amazing. And I'm sure you do too. And I would like you to do something about it. Well, you know, it's a, it's a Gideon's army. It's, little, it's a small group of people. And when we look back over the years of how we have uh, stayed here in Israel and stayed doing the work of the Lord and stayed getting this good news out among the nations, it's been a tiny group of people that have sponsored us and stayed with us. And some of you have been with us for 30 years. And those, we really thank God for you. And uh, we bless you. But if there's some of you watching today would like to say, would say I would like to help Jay and Meridel stay on the air and keep doing this good work from Zion. And uh, their families are now rallying around. Three young families are, are, are alongside of us. It's a miracle. And uh, we invite you to participate with us. Wow. And the way you can do that is go online, www.israelvision.tv. And there's a button there, a donate button, and you can go in there with your credit card through PayPal and begin to uh, sponsor and help, get us, help us to send the word of the Lord out among the nations. Or if you want to write to us, the, the address will come up on the screen. Also, if you want, you could even contact us through the email. 
and that is very simple, just jvistas, V-I-S-T-A-S, at gmail.com. So we thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. You know, our prayer is that uh, you would see your part as being one of those that say, I've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this.